Welcome back to mini lecture number seven um, with Jess Riesma. Here we'll be talking about multi-file projects and build systems. So some self-check questions just to begin. Um, how do you compile a file in GCC? Um, importantly, what are the different stages of compilation? What is a .o file in particular? Um, and how do those contribute? Why do some people declare functions um, at the top of a source file and define them later? How does that affect the code, or code organization? And what syntactical benefits does it provide? In other words, you know, you can do it that way, you don't have to, but if you do do it that way, what, does, what benefit does that give you? Suppose you're in charge of a project where you need to uh, manage a whole bunch of different source code uh, files uh, for your company's uh, you know, software project, um, or even just a, you know, a research venture. Or maybe you're a researcher and you need, you've got a lot of stuff. At any rate, you've got a whole bunch of code that you got to manage. Um, if you have a large program, you should do the following. Divide the code into multiple files. Um, I, <laughs> the first, uh, one of the first codes that I ever um, got from one of my advisors as, in a grad school was an old Fortran library. And they had something like 30 or 40 different routines, um, maybe even you know, about 40, I think, all in the same file. And so that made it easy. So you could just compile, you know, using iFortran, um, iFort or, or GFortran, you could just compile that one program. But it took forever to compile because there was lots of stuff going on. It took a while to optimize. Anyway, and it wasn't at all clean or easy if you wanted to read it. A much better way to, and it wasn't modular very well either. Um, what you want to do instead is you want to divide your code up into multiple files that make sense. So if you've got a bunch of things having to do with time, stick it all in a time library. If you've got a bunch of stuff dealing with file input and output for your program, stick it all in, in another, you know, um, in another file. Then what you want to do is you want to be able to um, compile all of those together. So organize based on similarity. And why do we want to do this? It's easier to print, it's easier to edit, read. Um, it's easier if you ever want to share your code with somebody. If you want to, uh, to take part of it out, you know, have it save it as a backup, but then replace it with some other code. And it can make compilation a lot faster. Um, so for instance, rather than compiling my advisor's um, you know, several many thousands of lines of code all in this one massive uh, <laughs> .f Fortran file, um, it was a lot easier when I took that, split it up into different files, and then was able to um, compile all of them and then just recompile one that needed recompiling if I ever needed to, if I ever made a change to one of those routines. So it makes compiling faster too when you've got a, a big project. When you're organizing code, you should create a source file for the set of routines that define and operate on a particular data structure. So for instance, if you've got a stack um, or a queue or some other cool data structure, create a .c file for that data structure and an accompanying .h file, a header file, which we'll talk about in a moment. You can also do this for a bunch of routines that handle access to a particular device, like a certain port if you're doing networking or something, uh, maybe the screen, um, maybe a device, like uh, uh, if you're working with like a, a virtual reality headset. Um, uh, all of these things can be done in a single um, you know, uh, file or two, uh, but you wanna basically organize these in, in these different source files. You can also do this for a set of routines that do different related types of operations like input and output, math, linear algebra, statistics. You might have a, a random number generator, uh, .c file or something. And then you also wanna have a separate C file for your driver, your main method. In other words, um, something that you could someday replace with something else, um, put that in its own little .c file and have it call code in all of these other um, source files. How do you call code in different source files? If, you know, if I call some file in some other um, uh, file, or if I call a function in some other file, how does my main method know how to access it? If it's not, you know, when I'm trying to compile a main method, how does this all work? Well, you gotta use header files. Just like you use header files to um, use like say printf or fprintf or many, many other things that we've seen so far, um, you can do that, you, you can make your own header files. Header files declare objects um, such as functions, variables, um, global variables, for instance. They could do type defs. Um, they, so they declare these objects for a source file, but they don't necessarily define them. Naming. A header file is traditionally called something like um, stack.h, for instance, um, if you're making like a stack object. And then you would put all the, so that would declare all the functions and maybe a type or two, um, but then all of these things would then be actually defined 
in stack.c. So stack.c is where you would write out your all of the functions. Stack.h would have like the type def for your stack object, and um, it would declare the functions, but it wouldn't define them. So it would just have like the method signature semicolon. And then to use these, <clears throat> what happens is the preprocessor will copy the header file into your source code. So if I pound include stack.h in my main method, what's going to happen is the preprocessor the preprocessor, when I'm compiling, the preprocessor will copy all the contents of stack.h into my uh, whatever file I have my main method in that I use the pound include stack.h. So it will just replace all of that text in that spot, on that one line, sort of. Um, it'll take all the stuff, copy it, paste it, or copy it from stack.h, paste it into um, my other file where I pound include that file. So then my the file that contains my main method will be able to access all of the, you know, it'll be able to compile by itself because now it has all the declarations of all these different source or all these different routines and maybe types um, that it needs in order to compile, even though they aren't in this file yet because I haven't like pound included stack.c. So because there's just declarations and there's nothing really new per se, we don't actually need to compile header files. They're going to be included into these other files, so they're not, they don't, we don't need to compile them separately. Their contents will actually be in other files um, that we compile later. What does a header file contain? Well, declarations and definitions for sure, um, so let's go through those first. Um, declarations, you can declare a type um, via a type def. You can, um, it's called a type def definition, but really it's a declaration of a type. Um, and function prototypes, the function stubs. Definitions include things like uh, global variables, global constants, um, C++ structs, unions, and enumerated types. So you can uh, you can have some of those. Though usually the variables you'll have them in a .c file. Um, preprocessor macros. If you define a preprocessor macro like function, um, you can do that too. They're fancy. They're tricky. They're also um, uh, plagued with uh, warnings and uh, and uh, not dead bodies, but uh, there's a lot of people who have misused preprocessor macros. So they're cool, but be careful if you ever do that. There's also preprocessor commands. The first one that you're familiar with is, of course, the include statement. Um, use those as, as necessary. Try to avoid overusing them, but you know you can. Um, there's also something called header guards. If you want more information about this, you can see it there. But the basic idea is, suppose that I have a main file that pound includes um, two header files, um, a.h and b.h. And um, a.h also includes b.h. Well, if, I, if my main file includes uh, a.h and b.h, it's going to include, it's going to copy in all the text from a, which also copies in all the text from b. So all the text from b.h will be in my, um, uh, in my main file twice. And that means that it'll define things multiple times. And that's not going to be good because then the compiler, when it's actually getting to the compile stage, not the preprocessor stage, will say, hey, you've defined this function or you've declared this function twice. This already exists, error. So what we do is we use a header guard um, and you basically say, hey, we're only it's, it's a technique to only include a header file once in the code. So you're only gonna get the declarations and definitions once. If you wanna read more, check out that website. It's short, it's great, um, I recommend it using header files. So if you want to use a standard header file like time.h, you use the angle brackets. That's part of the C standard. Um, it's, it's a standard header file, and so it will be installed in a predefined location on your computer system. So the angle brackets tell the compiler to, or the preprocessor I should say, to look in that predefined place. If you create your own header files, you're going to use the double quotation marks. And then the preprocessor is going to look in the current directory and any directories that you might specify in the include, in the include path um, when you tell your compiler slash preprocessor um, where to look for these. Um, but again, you wouldn't want to say like mylibrary.h surrounded in angle brackets because then the uh, preprocessor will look try to look for mylibrary.h in the standard library include places and that's not where your um, file probably is. Next up, we have build systems. And this is the story of my life. I love, um, no, it's not really. 
The most widely used and commonly recognized build system is probably the Make tool. Um, the Make tool is a, a really useful tool that you can use on um, basically any, uh, any computer system in one way or another, but usually ones that are like Linux, Unix based. What this does is it helps you automatically build and compile code from many different sources, uh, many different files. Make drives the compiler and other tools by telling it what to do in what order and uh, figuring out, uh, yeah, really what to do and in what order. The way that it works is first it reads a make file and uh, by default that make file is just called make file like you see there. But you could also have a file like foo.txt and if that file is a text file that follows the same standards and syntax of a make file, um, you can tell make to read that and it'll read that instead as a make file. That works too. But every make file will contain a series of rules for building and compiling files, um, and possibly more than that too. It's really pretty flexible. But at the bare, bare minimum, it'll have some rules. Each rule will contain the following three things. One is a target, which is the file that's going to be built by this rule. Um, it's the name that you would you would uh, use if you if you if you want to build like a program called my program. My program could be the target, and you could say like make my program on the compile line. And that you're basically telling make, build this target. Then that rule will have um, uh, dependencies for that file, like any files that that target will depend on. So if my program depends on um, main.c, then maybe main.c would be a dependency of, of my program. And so make is going to have to build or make sure that main.c is up to date before it builds my program. Then it will uh, have a line or possibly multiple lines telling it how to build that file. How do I use these dependencies to build the target? And so that could be anything from like a, a calling GCC to, to compile stuff, or it could be um, it can print stuff to the screen. Basically, it's kind of, you can almost treat it like a bash script, um, you can, like a one line bash script or maybe a couple line bash script without the shebang or anything, but just a couple of lines of code that you can execute. And that lets, it's really flexible, lets you do a lot of things. Once make has read and parsed to make file, what it will do is it's going to recursively build the target. So it's going to, if you say make, build my program, it's going to first look and see are its dependencies up to date. So it builds the target's dependencies before following the rule, uh, before doing the commands that build the file. So you say build my, my program, it looks for all the dependencies of my program and says, are these up to date? It will rebuild the target if it needs to, and if it doesn't have to, it won't, which is really what gives it some of its power and efficiency. So if, it, if any of the dependencies are um, older than the current um, uh, version of, say, my program, then it won't make it, then it won't do any new compilation. It says, you know, uh, your source code is older than uh, the program. Why do you need to recompile? But if you've edited your source code recently, then their modification times will be newer than your program. Therefore, if you do make, it will look and say, oh, main.c, that's out of date, or that's, that's re been recently updated. Now I'm going to use that and recompile my program. So that's what really gives it its power. So let's take this uh, situation as an example. So here we're trying to build something, a program, an executable called my program. We start with uh, source code files, uh, myprogram.c, vector.c, vector.h. So let's ignore myprogram.c for a second. Let's look at vector.h. Vector.h, the pound um, statements, the preprocessor uh, statements and commands here, those are part of a header guard, um, where if you want to learn more about that again, you can see um, the link that I showed you on an earlier slide. But really what vector.h does is it declares a new type called vec, which contains three doubles, x, y, and z, and it contains the method signature, it declares init vec, which will um, initialize a, a given vector. Okay, so vector.c includes vector.h because that's where the vec type is defined, or declared, um, and then it's also where init vec um, is declared as well. So then it actually, uh, vector.c defines init vec, as you can see, it just sets x, the x, y, and z components of uh, that struct to zero. And then uh, that's vector.c and vector.h, really, really simple. Myprogram.c 
Um, first of all, it includes a standard library, standardio.h, so it has the angle brackets. And then we include our custom library, vector.h, and that has the double quotes. Then we have the main function, um, vec my vec, so it declares a vector struct. And then we initialize that vector using passing that in by reference, or passing a reference. And then we print out done and return zero. Here's a make file that would go with that program. Now, I'm you can look at it here if you want, but we're going to actually walk through this step by step to see what's going on. Notice that it has three different rules here. One to build my program, one to build my program.o, and one to build my vector or vector.o. We'll go through each of these steps in between to see how make would work. So suppose you type in make my program. It's going to try to build that um, that, so that executable that you have as the target for this very first line. If you just type make, then make will um, look at the first target in the make file, which again is my program. So you could just type make and it will initialize, initially, initiate <laughs> all of the, the following stuff. Now we're going to um, illustrate how that make file would work. So that make file is in the upper left, and then a diagram of all the different files that are involved in this are on the lower right. The files on the bottom, myprogram.c, vector.c, and vector.h, are the three files that we start with. That's our source code. Those files exist. The files above it are, are outlined but aren't colored in, and that represents the fact that those files haven't been built yet. We're going to step through and see what make will do when it calls each of these things. Again, our goal is to build my program. So you could invoke this make file saying either make, which will look for the first target in this make file and build it, which is my program, or you could say make my program, and then it would go right to that. So that's what we're going to do. We want to build my program. What make is going to do is it's going to look for that rule. It's going to say, what are the dependencies? The dependencies here are myprogram.o and vector.o. Notice the question marks in the diagram on the right. Make is asking, do these files exist? And they don't. So because they don't exist, make wants to make them. Make will therefore call uh, itself, it'll call make again as a subprocess, and it will uh, say make myprogram.o. So then that instance of make will go to the myprogram.o rule, um, highlighted here, and it will check its dependencies. Does myprogram.c exist? Does vector.h exist? And it will say, yes, those files do exist. Great. So I don't have to make those. Then, because the dependencies are up to date, then make that version of make will call gcc, this, this command here that's associated with the myprogram.o. And this will actually tell, um, this, this command right here is how make will build myprogram.o using those dependencies. So at the end of those commands, make expects that there should be something called myprogram.o. And sure enough, this will produce myprogram.o by compiling myprogram.c. Once it does that, now I have a new file called myprogram.o, and it's colored in in the diagram on the lower right. Next, it'll go back to that, that subprocess of make will close, and it will go back to the original instance of make. That instance of make now has figured out that myprogram.o exists, but now it needs to figure out, does vector.o exist? And it says, no, it doesn't. So it needs to build vector.o. So it calls another subprocess of make and says make vector.o. So that instance of make will uh, go to this make file, the same one, and create uh, try to create vector.o. It finds that rule and then it says, is there a file called vector.c? Is there a file called vector.h? Are they up to date? And it says, yes, they both are. So now it can compile using that command um, gcc c vector.c o vector.o and that makes a file called vector.o. Both of the um, dependencies are satisfied. Now vector.o has been built. Um, now we have my program.o and my program uh, and vector.o. So now it's going that subprocess of make is going to end, and it's going to go back to the original um, make, which is still trying to build my program. It's already built my program.o and it just built vector.o. So now its dependencies are satisfied. Now it can go ahead and do the rule, gcc myprogram.o, uh, vector.o, dash o myprogram. 
Now it's going to compile both of those object code files into an executable called my program. And that is how my program will come into existence. That's how make recursively calls itself in order to check all of its dependencies to see whether they're up to date. If at any point, um, say for instance, I were to edit vector.c, then what will happen is when it calls make, my, it will try to build my program. It'll check all the dependencies of that. So it'll check my program.o and it'll say uh, my, my program.o depends on my program.c and vector.h. They're still up to date, no new changes. Um, so that's fine. But when it tries to check the dependencies of vector.o, it will notice that vector.c has been recently modified. Its modification time is newer than vector.o. That means that vector.c is, is more up to date than vector.o. That means vector.o is out of date. So it will rebuild vector.o from the new vector.c, and then it'll go back to trying to build my program. It will see that it needs to rebuild my program because now vector.o is newer than my program. And so it will replace my program with a new version of my program that it compiles with the new version of vector.o. Pretty slick, pretty schnazzy, and it's awesome. I love make files. If you ever have any questions in the future about them too, let me know. I'm happy to help. So let's summarize make files. What are the advantages and disadvantages? The first is that make files, you can define helpful rules. Um, not just compilation, but you can do things like make clean to remove the, some of the temporary files or some of the clutter involved in the compilation process, even the executables. You can also do things like make fast or make debug if you compile your code in different modes, like one, you know, the fast mode if you, uh, for an actual performance or an actual real simulation or something. Or you could do make debug where you want to compile your program in a debug mode where it does more checks and, um, you know, prints more verbose messages or something. So you can do that. Make files are really widely understood and used by a lot of programmers. So if you use this skill, there's a good chance that you'll be able to take it with you in your uh, future career to industry or to research. Um, I'm sure you'll, you'll come across this uh, time and time again. Make files also give you really fine grained control over the dependencies. So uh, you have to do a bit of work, but um, once you do that, you have a lot of control over what compiles in what order, um, and it's really, really hel uh, helpful. Make files are awesome because they're powerful and flexible. They take a lot of the work off of the programmer and you don't have to worry about exactly how to compile stuff. Um, it'll do it all automatically for you. It'll make sure that things stay up to date um, in some ways. Uh, and it can do a whole lot of fancy things. It's Turing complete. Um, so <laughs> it can do just about everything you want. Um, some features are a little bit harder to, to do, um, but it has a lot of features to make things easier for you to do as well. Um, and there's as much to learn there as you, you want to spend. You could take a semester course and make files if you wanted to become an expert. Um, but it's, it's really useful and handy. It's also, uh, if you're not sure you want to do this because it looks like it's kind of arcane or something, um, there are tools that exist for you to auto-generate make files, and I'll talk about one of them um, after this. It's also easy to build in parallel. So say you've got a project with you know um, 500 um, files that you've got to compile. Um, I've actually done this once <laughs> using a really big software project. And so it took forever. Um, it actually, I timed it once, it was about 45 minutes to compile all of the stuff. And so I used make files and you had to, you know, compile in parallel because otherwise it would take way, way, way longer. So yeah, 45 minutes um, compiling with four cores. Um, it was crazy. So anyway, J8, um, that flag right there just means compile with eight cores. And another reason to learn make files is, well, you'll need it for upcoming CS classes. So may as well kind of mention it here. What are the disadvantages? One is that you may need to write out a lot of dependencies. Again, there are ways to make this simpler. You can use um, automatic uh, target uh, build patterns and stuff. Um, you can create tools to the, or you can use tools to auto generate make files, but you might have to write out a lot of stuff. It's low level. Um, you're actually saying, here's how you compile something. Um, and that may be uh, annoying too. Also, make files aren't as portable as um, maybe we would like. If you have a very large project um, that uses a bunch of dependencies, you know, this library, that library, this other one, um, they're not all going to be installed in the same places on Linux, Macs, and, and PC, or in Windows, what am I saying? So in those cases where things aren't necessarily installed in the places that make might think they are or that you 
if you have to tell make where things are installed, right? Like libraries and stuff. So if they're not in the places that you tell it to look for them, then it might be hard and it might make might have some trouble um, building things. So that can be a, a problem. And make files can also be pretty complex. Um, building this recursive tree of dependencies. Um, it's really awesome and it's really cool, but it can be complex too. Other build systems. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about these, but I'll talk about two. One is auto tools. This is um, part of the uh, GNU uh, tool chain. And it's an older thing, but it's still used in a lot of Linux communities. Um, if you wanna learn how to do that, uh, feel free. I'm not gonna cover it. I've never had to learn it myself. There's also something called CMake. Um, <clears throat> CMake is one of those special pieces of software that is really widely accepted and is powerful enough that it can generate make files and it can generate projects and solutions for Visual Studio or Xcode. Um, so if you have some code and you set up a CMake file, uh, you know, if you know how to do that, you can do a lot of really powerful things. Um, once you do that, once you've generated a make file or these things, then you can run the make file, right? Um, you can analyze it if you want, but it does a lot of stuff for you. CMake is higher level than make. So you can say like, here's the location of, of libraries if it's Windows. If it's Mac, here's the location of the install directory for this other dependency. If it's Linux, here's the dependency for this install directory. And you can say like, if it's not installed, here's how you install it. So it can you know go to, web, to, go to the web, um, install something from GitHub for instance. It can do a lot of cool things for you. And because of this, it's widely used for cross-platform build systems. So if you ever develop software that's gonna run on multiple platforms, CMake is a good thing to know. Um, so again, it can help you auto-detect or install dependencies, um, but CMake is a very, very powerful thing. Most people use either makefiles or CMake, um, but almost everybody uses at least makefiles. That's it, so in review, um, here are some questions for you. I encourage you to pause. If you have any questions about these, contact me. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to um, to answer your questions. Um, a number of you have already been um, messaging me and, and I've been emailing you back. But yeah, let me know. Um, I'm here to help. I'm definitely here to help. Here's a practice problem. Um, so using a program that you've written before um, with a, a number of functions, I challenge you to move all of the code except the main method into a separate .c file. Or if you want more of a challenge, organize it into multiple .c files and then create a header file for each of those .c files except your main file. Um, and then using the, the steps that we described earlier here with the headers. Then compile everything together. Now if you really want some extra, um, extra points, some brownie points, here are some other objectives that you can do. For each header file, include a header guard. For some of them you might need to do that, but if you don't need to do that, you could always do it anyway, just as a good best practice. Number two, try to incorporate third-party source files, such as this MT vector library that you can get here. It's really simple. It's just a .c file and a .h file, and it has a lot of cool stuff for, you know, working with vectors and doing math with them. Get that to work in your code. Um, even just calling a single function from that, if you can do that, that's a big step because that's a big part of programming is using code that other people have written and incorporating it in your code. Um, so that's a really good practice. And just for uh, an extra objective uh, beyond that, put it all in a make file um, and get it to, uh, uh, to automatically compile for you. So that's it. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you enjoyed. See you.